Welcome everyone! How are you guys doing today? Happy Thursday! Feliz Jueves! Welcome back to the channel. If you're new around here, my name is Mariana. You're watching Mexico Relocation Guide. And uh, if you're new around here, I do these live Q&As to give you some information about moving to Mexico. You guys send me in your questions or you normally post them around here. And then uh, we go just one by one. Uh, historically, I've been doing kind of just like whatever questions you guys post in the comments I take and then I answer them on the spot. Um, but I've been getting a lot of feedback. Thank you so much for those of you who have been sending me feedback that, you know, that seems to be too long or, you know, that maybe it seems that the same questions are always asked over and over and again. And I absolutely agree. So to make the experience better for everybody, I asked uh, our followers to submit your questions ahead of time, which a lot of you guys did. I got like 65 questions in the course of like three or four days. Uh, so thank you. I'm going to choose only like 20, like 10 or 15 questions today. Um, and then, you know, I'll go through them as, as I get them um, or, or, you know, from the people that I got them that submitted them in the form. Um, and that is supposed to help you uh, not only, or supposed to help make these videos not only better, shorter, a better experience for you guys watching at home, um, but it'll also help me be able to put chapter markers on uh, this live stream and the replay so that if you are watching the replay, it can be easy for you to just skip over to whatever uh, piece of information that you're looking to get an answer for. So let's get started. Um, thank you guys so much for being here. If you're wondering how to post your question for future live streams, I'm gonna I'm gonna put in that page in uh, the chat. And keep in mind that I moving forward for now, unless I tell you otherwise, for now I will only take uh, questions that have been posted in advance. So all the questions that I have today for today's live stream have already been sent to me ahead of time. Uh, thank you so much for being here, Kenneth, Carla, Wild Bill, love it, Cindy. Um, I love that you guys are here joining me early and um, let's get started. So the first question comes in, they're wondering like, hey, I'm confused. When you post cities that you can live on less than 2,000 or 1,500 US dollars a month, I'm confused about that because I thought that the residency requirements are double than that. And um, yeah, so you might see that I might post on our blog, you know, yes, you can live in Merida on $1,500 a month. Or yes, you can live in Playa del Carmen on $2,000 or less a month. And while, yes, that's absolutely the case, the cost of living, it obviously depends on your lifestyle, your rent, uh, how often you're going to go out, entertainment, uh, what your eating habits are like, and a lot of variables, right? It's, very, it's a very personal decision. I give you normally a breakdown of what you can find for rent, what typical utilities will cost for two people. Um, and then I also give you a breakdown of like groceries and things like that. However, just because you can live in Mexico on a much lower amount than the Mexican consulates are requiring, you will still have to qualify for residency first. Uh, the residency requirements in 2023 vary by consulate. Some consulates require as little as 2,500 US dollars a month for temporary residency, and they can go up to $3,500 a month for temporary residency uh, based on monthly income. The majority of you are going to get residency based on economic solvency, unless you are a Mexican national or you have ties to a Mexican national uh, in Mexico. Then you can petition for family members to become residents of Mexico. And, you know, the income requirements are not exactly the same. So, but the majority, right, are not going to have a Mexican a tie or a Mexican national family member that they can get residency through. So the majority of you are probably going to be through economic solvency, which again, in 2023, the lowest amount that I have seen for temporary residency is at the Phoenix consulate. And that is 2,500 US dollars a month. And then it goes up from there because every consulate takes it um, or has a different variance in that economic uh, income requirement. Uh, for permanent residency, that income requirement is higher. And if you want to know the income requirements by consulate, it's on my website. I'm going to post the, um, after we are done recording this, I will post all those links in the description of this video. So hopefully that gives you some clarity into why I mentioned that, yes, you can live in these cities for this amount, but you will first have to qualify for residency 
so something for you to consider. Uh, the next question is, how long should I stay somewhere? And I get this question a lot, actually. How long should I stay somewhere uh, when deciding on a place to live? And also, what time of year is best? And um, quite honestly, that's just like a very, very personal question. Uh, it's very tough because, you know, I know people who have visited a place once, they fell in love with it. Uh, they bought a house right away and they're still happy living there. Like I, I know several people who have done that and there's no right or wrong answer. I also know people who have gone to visit a place that they heard nothing but amazing things about from either friends or they saw YouTube videos or they read a lot of Facebook group posts and they got really excited and they went to see this place and they absolutely hated it. Um, and, you know, there's no point in them staying three months, six months, uh, if they know in their heart that they're not going to like this place. And then I also know people who have stayed, you know, are still trying to figure it out years into their, uh, you know, travels and visiting different areas of Mexico. They're still trying to figure out their ideal place. Um, so I think it's a very, very personal decision. I, I don't think there's like a magic answer or I don't think anybody can really tell you like, oh, well, you know, if you like this, this and this, then this place is perfect for you. Um, because at the end of the day, you have to experience it yourself. What is it going to be like for you to live there daily? I will say that I would say at the very least, you should try to at least visit a place before just moving there, right? Just taking everything that you see at face value, everything that you read at face value and just moving there, like packing everything and just moving there. That might work out for some people, but it might not. And that would be a very big costly mistake. So I would say at the very least, try to visit a place. Um, and once you do make plans to visit a place, I would say at the very least, try to stay three to six months. Three to six months, I think, is a good amount of time for the honeymoon stage to come and go. And then you be able to understand, you know, how things work in that specific town or in that specific city, how things work in the neighborhood that you're staying in. Or maybe you don't like the neighborhood that you're staying in, and then that way you can visit different neighborhoods. Um, and you can understand more what the vibe is like throughout different times of the year. Uh, as far as like when or what time of the year I think is best for you to visit, um, that's also very dependent on where you're looking to move in Mexico because the rainy season is different for the central part of Mexico than it is for uh, the beach areas, right? And it's also very different than it is for the Baja Peninsula. Hurricane season is different for the Baja Peninsula than it is for the Caribbean. You know, they're on two different oceans. Um, and, you know, the hot months are different for the central highlands than they are for, like, the hottest months are different for the central highlands than they are for, you know, other parts that are maybe further up north. Uh, so with all that in mind, I think first you have to decide, you have to narrow down at least a few places that you're going to be considering and then you can start looking into all these variables, like what is the weather like, you know, um, is it is it walkable friendly, right? Like if you have to be honest with yourself, if it if you have walking issues, maybe Guanajuato isn't going to be the best city for you because there's a lot of hills. Maybe San Miguel de Allende is not going to be the best place for you because it has a lot of hills. If you're very sensitive to altitude uh, or elevation, uh, then maybe, you know, these areas are also not going to be the best for you and you have to stay somewhere a little bit lower, uh, like maybe one of the beach towns or maybe somewhere, you know, like Oaxaca, which is lower in elevation than something like San Miguel de Allende or Querétaro or Mexico City. Uh, so with all those things considered, I will also point you to a guide that I put together that's also on our blog uh, that gives you some of these things that you should be asking yourself before doing a scouting trip. And that way it helps you narrow down some of the places that you think might be best for you. But at the very least, I would say you should visit a place before just blindly moving there. And I think the majority of people do, um, but that would be my best advice. Now, uh, the next question I have received is, will the income requirements be discounted for retirees on a fixed income? And um, there is no, I know for other countries, like for example, in Panama, they have a retiree visa, uh, the pensionado vi uh, visa. And, you know, you in, in other countries, like I think Ecuador also has this, where, you know, if you make a certain amount of money each month uh, in social security or a pension, if you're from Canada or something like, uh, you know, your uh, 
whatever other benefit you get in the country that you're from, then you can get a residency visa because you're retired and therefore on a fixed income and they give you kind of a break. Well, Mexico doesn't have this a uh, retiree type of residency visa. The income requirements are the same, whether you're on a fixed income or whether you are still making an active income. The difference is that a lot of retirees who don't have an active income or maybe don't make the $2,500 that I was talking about or up to the $3,300 that I was mentioning, depending on the consulate they're gonna apply with, uh, end up having some form of savings. So you can apply through savings. You don't only have to make an active income. You can have uh, savings or you can have uh, retirement accounts like an IRA, a 401k. Uh, if you have invested in your life, right, and you have investment brokerage accounts, those also qualify you. So just keep in mind that there are other options aside from active income. If you have savings, and, um, you know, maybe it's not enough to qualify you for temporary residency just based on savings and you have a little bit of income. You can always pay yourself from your savings each month into a checking account. Some people have done this and have actually qualified for residency that way, because as long as they can show six months back or, you know, some consulates want 12, but most consulates want six for temporary residency. If you can show six months back of this total amount that you have been receiving each month, uh, then some most, you know, most consulates that, that like satisfies the requirements. And some people have done that. Uh, they have some savings, maybe, you know, they don't have enough to qualify it on savings alone, but they pay themselves enough to make up the difference for their income each month. And I think that's a great tactic. Um, but no, there is no retiree residency, unfortunately. Hopefully in the future, uh, there will be some form of immigration reform and um, and maybe the requirements will change. And, you know, there's a lot of talk about this happening. Nothing has been officially posted. So that is all just rumor mill at this point. Uh, but hopefully maybe that'll change in the future and, you know, it'll encourage more um, immigration, right, through the legal channels instead of people just ending up moving to Mexico illegally anyway. All right, let's get to the next one. I'm not sure where in Mexico I want to live yet and plan to stay at different Airbnbs. Do I need to notify I and M each time I move. Uh, this is a big one. So, if you if you don't know this, um, the short answer is yes, basically. But if you don't know this, you're supposed to notify the immigration authorities, the Instituto Nacional de Migración in Mexico, which is a immigration authorities in Mexico, um, of any change to your residency status within 90 days of that change. That includes a change of address or cambio de domicilio, a change of marital status, a change of name, um, and you're supposed to do it within 90 days of this change happening. But I understand that there's a lot of you that will probably not know where you're going to live in Mexico right away. Some of you, and I fully encourage this, some of you get your residency years before you actually plan on living in Mexico. So you come and you do your canje, uh, which is the exchange of your residency stamp for your card. And now you have given immigration an address in Mexico that you are supposed to be living in, right? Um, so what can happen if immigration finds out that you are not indeed living in this location and that you didn't make the change within 90 days of any new location? Well, the risk is that you can get charged 20 to 100 times of the UMA amount as a fine for not notifying INM of this change. It's another source of income for immigration, of course. Um, and, you know, how can they find out that you are no longer living in this home? Well, sometimes immigration does random house checks. They are rare but they do happen. They've happened to people that we, uh, that we know and customers of ours. And if they do a random house check and they find out that you are no longer living in this home, they can issue you a fine, which in today's dollars, just to give you an average, let's just go to the high amount and let's say it's 100 times the UMA, it can be about 1,100 US dollars, which is significant. It's substantial, especially if you're on a fixed income. Um, and it obviously depends on the exchange rate. So what do I recommend? If you're not planning to live in Mexico for, you know, 
uh, two, three years from now, right? I would say still get your residency, like, like nail that down, secure it. That should be your number one priority, even if you don't actually plan on moving to Mexico for a few years. I would say that as soon as you have an address that you plan to actually be living in, whether you're scouting different areas, maybe you're going to visit Playa del Carmen, and then you also want to see Mazatlán, you're a beach person, but you also want to see some cities and you, you've heard really great things about Lake Chapala. You're going to spend three months here, three months here, three months here. I would say it's not absolutely necessary that you make a change with immigration every 90 days. Um, it can be tedious, especially because depending on which immigration office you go to, it can be waiting all day long or it can be waiting a week for you to get an appointment. So it just It, it's really up to you and your risk assessment, right? Like how much are you willing to take this risk? Um, but I would say that at the very least, once you do have a pretty good idea of what your permanent home base is going to be, then I would make the change with the immigration authorities within 90 days of that. So if you don't plan on coming back to Mexico for another, you know, one, two, three years, you do have to come back and do your renewal. You have to do your renewal at the original immigration office that you got your residency card in. And if you change addresses at the time of renewal, you're supposed to do the change of address before the renewal. If you do it at the time of the renewal, then it's an easy red flag for immigration to know that you didn't make a change of address and you will most than, more than likely be charged this penalty, this fee. Um, but my best advice is as soon as you have a pretty good idea of what your home base is going to be and what that address is going to be uh, in Mexico, then I would make the changes with immigration. Uh, and again, these house checks are very rare, but they do happen. And I just, my goal is to let you know that, yeah, I encourage you to scout different areas, but also you should know what the risk is associated with that. All right, let's see. What does it mean when a consulate asks for financial statements or to have a verification letter? Uh, so some consulates, some Mexican consulates, require additional proof of like authenticity that your bank statements haven't been modified or that they're, you know, that they are basically legitimate, right? That they that the amount that the bank statement says that you have every month is authentic and certifiable. And a lot of consulates want you to bring a letter from your financial institution, whether it's your bank or your um, community bank or whatever financial institution you're uh, bringing proof of statements from. And they want something from that financial institution stating that, you know, they verify that you, John Doe, are the owner of this bank account um, and that, you know, it's signed by somebody within the financial institution. They don't tell you that they want it from, you know, a personal banker or they don't want, uh, they don't tell you specifics on whether they want it, you know, from somebody specifically in that bank or what their title is. Some financial, some Mexican consulates will want this financial verification letter on bank letterhead. But the problem is that a lot of us, right, we bank with banks that, Either one won't do this for us because that's just part of their policy. They, they, they refuse to issue this letter uh, to you. Or two, maybe you bank with a financial institution that doesn't have a, an actual physical branch. Uh, or maybe if they do have one, it's nowhere near you and it's impossible for you to get this letter. So here are some workarounds on how you can get this like verification letter that a lot of people have done and it seemed to work for them. One, if you have a financial advisor, um, you can always have them on their letterhead sign you a letter or write you a letter stating that they are your financial advisor, they handle your accounts for you, and they can verify that the bank accounts that you are trying to prove or show proof of are um, authentic, that they haven't been modified, and that the balances are correct. Um, have them sign it, and then you take that to the consulate to your appointment. That is uh, option one. But if you don't have a financial planner, then what do you do? Well, another option is to go to your nearest UPS store, somewhere where they have a notary. There's other ways to go around this. You don't have to go to a UPS store, but you have to go somewhere where they have a notary and have a notary um, at, along with a witness because you normally have to have a witness sign that your bank statements um, 
are, you know, that you present your bank statements in front of them, that they are, you know, they are as accurate as you uh, present them to be and have your witness sign and bring that to the consulate. So those two workarounds tend to be the most, um, the most common that people use and the most like, you know, the best way or the best alternative to having literally uh, Wells Fargo or Chase or uh, some other financial institution write you a letter and sign it and say that, you know, you, John Doe, are the owner of this bank account. So hopefully that helps somebody. Um, I know it's, and not all consulates ask for this. Some consulates are stricter than others. Um, for example, I know that uh, McAllen, Texas, for example, it was also not only asking for a verification letter, but they were asking for uh, a letter from your employer stating that you were going to continue working until uh, even after you move to Mexico, right? So especially if you're applying based on you having current employment. So that is your income verification. You saying, you know, I make X amount of dollars each month through my employer. And then, you know, bringing your bank statements and maybe some pay stubs. Well, some consulates um, were asking or started asking for an actual letter from your employer saying, hey, you know, this person is going to continue having this source of income even after they move to Mexico. And I mean, it makes sense. They want to ensure that people aren't just going to move to Mexico and then have no way to support themselves and um, just become one of the many people in Mexico already. There's lots of migrants that are coming through and, um, you know, using a lot of the resources that the Mexican government has available to them. So they don't want just another number of people that are going to be basically, you know, taking part into that and not stimulating the economy. Um, so some people might not have this letter from their employer. Um, at that case, I would say consulate shop, right? Go somewhere where the consulate isn't going to be asking you for these things or maybe um Maybe, maybe uh, for a lot of people, for example, I had a customer last week tell me, well, you know, my wife is going to retire after she uh, gets her residency. For now, she qualifies for it on her own through employment, but she plans to actually retire after she gets her residency. With her retirement income, she would be more than okay to live in Mexico comfortably. She's going to be making like $1,700 a month or something like that, along with his income. Um so what should she do? And quite honestly, in, in my opinion, I would say go ahead and apply with her income and don't volunteer the information that she's going to retire. Um, I, I wouldn't just like go and tell the consulate, well, she's not going to have this income after she moves to Mexico. I wouldn't volunteer that information um, until, you know, if in case they ask you, then I would be, you know, very honest with them. But I would volunteer that information because it probably won't look like you're going to continue to have this income afterwards. So, yeah, just a couple of tidbits of uh, income verification and maybe employment verification that some of you might want to know. Uh, the next question is, are there rent controls in Mexico? Is there a cap on how much my rent can increase every year? And... Um, Yes, the answer is basically yes. There is a cap. It varies by city. For example, in Mexico City in 2023, that amount is 10%. Um, but it totally depends on where the rental that you're looking at is located and what your contract agreement might say. Um, but even if there is legally a cap, there are still landlords that will increase the rent by more than the actual cap. And while it may not technically be legal for them to do so, they get away with it because, uh, one, it's hard for you to fight that, right? It's tedious. It takes resources. It takes time. And you need a place to live. And in the meantime, you either have to pay that amount or find somewhere else to go. So in my, in my opinion and in my experience, I would say, one, try to negotiate it with the landlord. If they do try to increase you by more than whatever is allowed in your local community, try to negotiate it with them. You know, if, especially if, if you like living there, they're a good landlord, you have been a good tenant, you've paid on time, make your case that you're a good tenant, you know, you don't ask for a lot of things, you've been paying on time. Try to negotiate that so that you can stay. Because I know 
moving sucks. Uh, nobody likes it. Uh, nobody likes the expense of it, having to box things up and then having to get acclimated in a new place. So try to negotiate it first. But if they won't budge and a lot of landlords won't budge, especially in touristy areas like Puerto Vallarta or, you know, Ajijic or Playa del Carmen, Cabo, uh, you know, just to name a few where somebody is probably going to come in and take the rent at the higher amount, which is why I want to really urge everybody to think about when you're renting something, really understand what it could be doing to the market. Just because you can afford it um, doesn't mean you automatically should take it, even if it is like a freaking deal for you to take a place at 20,000 pesos, 25,000 pesos. It might be significant for you to, to, or significantly reducing your cost of living to take a place at this rental amount. But just think about it, right? Like, is it actually worth it? Take a look at the actual local groups, not only the expat groups, because the expat groups are where some of these things are overinflated. Um, and where I have seen some of the most crazy rental prices uh, in recent times. So just try to take a look around at some of the local groups, ask a neighbor, you know, what the, what what rentals are going on uh, for around there, or maybe, you know, a business owner, just so you get an idea, like, you know, is this comparable to what other people are paying around me? And, um, you know, or am I getting a bad deal here? Uh, I would also recommend going on Facebook Marketplace and uh, I have a really good blog post that tells you exactly what keywords you can search so that you can search in Spanish and then be able to see what's coming back in Spanish. Look at the neighborhood too, it matters, right? Like location absolutely matters. Uh, the more trendy neighborhoods, especially in touristic areas, like again, I'm gonna choose Puerto Vallarta as an example. Uh, if you're looking at Puerto Vallarta, if you go further away from the ocean, then obviously your rent should be lower. But the closer you are to the ocean, the closer you are to the trendy neighborhoods like the romantic zone or the hotel zone or the marina, then obviously uh, you know, there's gonna be more demand for those places. But if it is, even if it is in one of those places, just look at what's renting around you and what are the people that are looking for those things in Spanish? What are they willing to pay or what are they charging for these places? Um, and that way you can see like, you know, what you're being charged or the places that you've been uh, looking at, are they within the price range that maybe a local would pay? And that way you don't inflate the cost of living for everybody around you. Uh, but, you know, to answer somebody's question, yes, there are price controls, there are price caps, it just depends on how much you're willing to fight for that. Oh, this is a good one. Are all moving companies trustworthy to move my household goods to Mexico from either the United States or Canada? I think it, it applies for any country. And uh, the answer is no, not all international moving companies are great. Um, some of them used to be great at one point and they've been burnt because, you know, they treated customers badly. Um, they didn't do good or they didn't take responsibility when people's things got damaged and therefore they didn't want to make a claim on their insurance. Um, so there are some really good ones and there are some really, really, really bad ones. And um, we do have a couple of recommendations, by the way, in our Complete Mexico Relocation Guide of international moving companies we work with. But I do want to mention that there's a difference between working with an international moving company that is insured, has a customs broker that they work with on the border, and then there's the difference between hiring somebody with a truck that will fit your things on the back of his truck. And the biggest difference is, one, going to be price, obviously. Two, is going to be, you know, their their securities or their, um, their insurance, right? The guy with the, that can hold things on the back of his van or take things just across uh, probably doesn't have insurance. In fact, most likely they do not. They probably also don't work with anybody at customs um, at the border. 
So what usually happens is those people uh, will pay somebody off at the border so that they don't get charged, you know, the high tariff or import taxes for bringing these things in. Whereas an international moving company works with a customs broker and then they, you know, de- do things legally, not under the table. Uh, the other big thing is insurance. So you have to really ask yourself, how much is your stuff worth? Is it is it worth a lot to you? And if even if it's sentimental, if it's sentimental, it probably wouldn't be able to be replaced. But if it's something expensive, you really have to think, you know, what would be the replacement value of this piece of furniture or maybe, you know, a piece of uh, a a tool or um, a musical instrument or something like that, something that can be expensive. Um, So I would highly recommend you do your due diligence. Definitely look at people's reputation. Uh, We have done all that research for you, and we only recommend people that, one, have a good reputation, uh, two, our customers have had a really good experience with, three, are going to be professional in the way that they pack things, and they're going to be very, very straightforward with you on the things you cannot bring so that there aren't any accidents or that there aren't any issues when your shipment gets to the border and it's not held up in aduana or customs. And three, you know, how often they communicate with the customer and how the customer feels about their communication style. So which is really important because I'm sure you want to know where your things are and when they're going to get there and, and you can't wait for things to arrive. And it would really be not good if you don't know where they are and nobody answers your questions or nobody gets back to you, which has been the case with some of the companies that, one, we don't recommend uh, and have been burned through um, our our network. So, yeah, do your due diligence and really, really ask the questions, you know, how much is your insurance covering me for? Uh, You know, who's going to do the packing? What happens in case of, you know, if it gets stuck at, like, what would be a situation that it could get stuck at? customs um, and how if you feel like you have a good rapport with that international moving company and they seem to be really professional and I would say move forward with it and then ultimately it's up to you like what what is your budget for moving how much are you willing to pay to bring your things uh, to Mexico if you're wondering you can find almost everything in Mexico that you would in the United States I mean there are there may be like a couple of things that are very specific that maybe you won't find as easily in Mexico, like especially um, cookware and like really, really high end cookware. Like if you like uh, Le Crusette or, you know, these kinds of pots and pans that are only sold at specialty shops in the United States or Canada, um, well, you may have a harder time finding those in Mexico, but there is probably some alternative to it that would be perfectly fine. So just keep that in mind too. You, it, it may be actually better for you to sell as much as possible before you move and then you know get those things when you move to Mexico. Uh, so yeah. This is one that I've been getting recently a lot and, uh, and I'm, it makes me really excited because that means a lot of Mexicanos like me are thinking of moving back to the homeland and it makes me really happy. So the question is, I was born in Mexico, but I live in the United States or Canada. I can apply to any any Mexican uh, Mexican that has been living outside of Mexico since I was little. Can I become a Mexican citizen? And the answer is you are always a Mexican citizen. Uh, if you were born in Mexico and you have a birth certificate birth certificate or acta de nacimiento from Mexico, you will always be a Mexican national. Uh, So you never lose that. Even if you became a U.S. citizen or a U.S. lawful permanent resident, or you became a citizen from another country, you will always be a Mexican under the Mexican authorities' eyes. Now, the way for you to claim your citizenship is you would need to bring your original birth certificate or acta de nacimiento to your nearest Mexican consulate and, um, and then they are going to ask for additional documents. I would suggest that you go to the Mexican consulate website nearest you. And under um, Servicios Consulares or Consular Services, you will see the information for Pasaporte or Passport. Uh, you can get it for one year, three years, six years, or 10 years. And if you are over the age of 60, you get 50% off your passport, which is 
really nice. Uh, the cost starts at $40 for one year, and then it goes up to about $150 for the 10-year passport, which in my opinion, I would get the 10-year. Uh, but you don't need to do anything specific after that. I would recommend you signing up to get your court um, and I would also recommend that you sign up to get your RFC as soon as you can, because that will help facilitate so many things once you actually move to Mexico. Uh, but yeah, there's nothing more specific that you need to do. You don't need to take a test. Um, you don't need to denounce your citizenship somewhere else. Mexico allows you to have dual citizenship with other countries. Um, and yeah, welcome back. So for all people who suffer from celiac disease or who have some intolerance to gluten, um, will I be able to find gluten-free items in Mexico? And the answer is yes. Actually, the majority of Mexican cooking in its natural form is gluten-free. Uh, you know, we use a lot of rice, we use a lot of beans. The way we marinate meats and chicken uh, tend to be gluten-free. We use corn. And so we use a lot of things that are naturally gluten-free in Mexican traditional cooking. That's not to say that there aren't packaged goods that have flour in them, right? Like, you know, if you buy those um, chicharrones, which are inflated, basically that's all flour. And, um, and aside from like Northern Mexico, Northern Mexico uses a lot of flour tortillas, where, whereas like the central part of Mexico and Southern Mexico, it's basically corn or corn. Um, but if you go to a grocery store, you will probably see more and more items that have the little wheat symbol with a line across it and, um, and say the words sin gluten or libre de gluten. Uh, or if you go to a restaurant, that would also be a good way for you to see if something on a, a menu item is gluten free. It would either say sin gluten or libre de gluten. Or you could ask a waiter, right? Like, I would take that into your own hands, if, especially if you're very sensitive to it. I would not assume anything and just make sure you double check when eating out. Um, but more and more packaged uh, companies or packaged good companies, more and more retailers are adding these symbols into uh, their foods because obviously it's becoming something more... Uh, prevalent in not only Mexicans, but everywhere around the world where people are starting to realize that, hey, you know what, flour actually doesn't sit well with me. Um, so yeah, sin gluten, libre de gluten is usually how you would know. Okay, and um, this is going to be my last question today before I look at some of y'all's uh, comments here in the chat. But the next one is, I'm a permanent resident, but plan to drive my car only in Baja California, can I drive my foreign plated car as a permanent resident? And the short answer is yes. Uh, within the free zone of Mexico, which includes Quintana Roo, parts of Sonora, all of the border towns, and all of the Baja Peninsula, which is Baja California and Baja California Sur, uh, is a free zone. So in the free zone, you don't need what is known as a temporary import permit or TIP for you to bring your foreign plated car. However, if you plan to drive outside of this free zone at any point, you cannot drive your foreign plated car without getting a temporary import permit. And a temporary import permit is only given to people who are either Mexican nationals living abroad and coming to Mexico as visitors basically, or temporary uh, residents that are, you know, have a temporary residency. So we're only temporarily here, like they're not permanent residents. Um, so for permanent residents, there's no way for you to get a temporary import permit if you plan to drive outside the free zone. But if you're in the free zone, you can absolutely drive your foreign plated car. You can go back and forth between the United States and Mexico with your foreign plated car and your permanent residency card. Uh, the thing that you have to keep in mind is that you will absolutely still need to get Mexican auto insurance. That is a must if you plan to drive in Mexico. Not only a foreign plated car, but a Mexican car, a rental car, you should absolutely get the insurance. Because if you don't and you're caught in a problem, like you get into an accident and they determine it's your fault, um, especially if you don't know the language and the cop just sides with the person that can explain it better, which happens a lot, 
so you definitely want to make sure that you have Mexican auto insurance because if you don't, it can get you into a lot of trouble. You could end up in jail until the until the issue gets resolved or until the damages have been paid or until you know something is resolved with that matter. So you definitely want to avoid that. Um, and that's not to scare you. That's just to give you the reality of what has happened and what will can actually happen, especially if you don't dominate the language. So I would say don't risk it. Get Mexican insurance. If you rent a car, I, it's absolutely important for you to get at least the minimum coverage. Um, and there are rules in Mexico what the minimum coverage is. So yeah, hopefully that helps you. Uh, also, if you are going to be driving in the uh, free zone as a permanent resident, it is imperative. It is very, very, very important for you to have a foreign uh, driver's license and for it to be valid. So another thing for you to consider. So I hope these questions have been helpful. Yeah, I'm going to add um, chapter markers here for all these questions that I covered. And whenever you watch this playback or this replay, it should be easier for you to just skip ahead or go back and see exactly the information that you're looking to uh, read up on or listen to. I'm going to include links to all the things that I mentioned in the comment section and in the description of this video. And if you want to post questions for a future live stream, you have to do it through this page. So I'm going to again put it on the comment section. Just go to mexicorelocationguide.com forward slash live streams, post your question there, and we'll, I will choose as many as I can, first come, first serve basis, and then I will also try to choose some that maybe don't get asked um, every single week. So thank you all so much. I will be uh, doing another live stream next week, Jan June 1st, with a gentleman who I'm so excited to bring on. He uh, lives in Morelia. And uh, he's going to talk all about his experience living in Morelia, being married to a Mexican lady. Uh, he had a stroke, so he's going to talk about how he recovered in a Mexican hospital and the care that he got and his ongoing treatment and the cost of it all and how he lives on his Social Security uh, pension alone. So I think you're really going to like it. And I also think that you're going to enjoy learning more about Morelia and why, you know, it's not as dangerous or as scary as the media sets it out to be because it's in the state of Michoacan, which there are places in Michoacan I would not go to. Um, but Morelia is certainly one place that I think would be okay. So yeah, if you want to learn all about future live streams, the only way you can do that is uh, by signing up or subscribing to this channel. So that way you get notified of any future videos, any future live streams, and you can set a reminder there. Um, but if you want to get my other tips and advice on how to find the best rentals, uh, what is the true cost of living, uh, whenever I make any updates to the residency requirements, that is all through my newsletter. So if you want to sign up for the newsletter, it's MexicoRelocationGuide.com forward slash newsletter. So thank you all. I hope this has been helpful and I hope you guys enjoy this new format. As always, I appreciate your feedback. So if you have any new ideas, send them to me, info at mexicorelocationguide.com. And I will see you guys in the next video. Nos vemos.